So we've been looking in these videos at what I consider the biggest blind spot for people in reading the Gospels or a biblical book in general. We've been looking at the Gospel of John and the structure or the architecture of the book and the kinds of questions it raises and how it directs our eye to certain things we might otherwise miss about the way the book is composed. If we look again at the introduction, this is sort of part two or maybe a bonus video on the introduction, but we start uh, again with the structure of the book, six major chapters, if you will, from the original author. There's the four main sections uh, here, the body of the book, the visits that Jesus paid to the city of Jerusalem for the occasion of various festivals, traveling from Galilee to Judea, and then usually back to Galilee, or at least outside of Judea. And we noticed how these sections all begin with the same expression up here, and they end in uh, a pattern as well, each of the sections beginning and ending the same. And on theme, that is, rel that is uh, related clearly to the overarching purpose of the book. These signs are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The goal is for the reader to have life, and that life comes by believing. And each of the sections closes climactically with the account of, of people coming to believe or stating their belief in Jesus. In the first half of the book, just belief, usually in response to various signs, and in the second half of the book, um, in response not to signs, no sign to John the Baptizer, but because of the truth of the things that were witnessed and spoken. So we're now looking at the introduction, the lot of debate over how far the prologue or the introduction of the book extends, and structurally it appears to extend from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 2, verse 12. We looked at its structure, we looked at it, uh, a sort of a way to analyze the logical flow, the thought flow, the movement of the progression forward, you know, of the thoughts of the stories is always in the end the most important thing about what's written. The structure is is uh, sort of secondary as we have talked about in previous videos. But it is nonetheless a kind of coat hanger uh, on which the coat is designed to sit so that you can see the coat more in its natural uh, appearance or its natural shape. So let's look again uh, a little bit differently this time at the flow of the ideas, the stories, in the first section, the introduction to the book. In the beginning, very famous words, was the word everybody knows right away, those words coming from the book of Genesis. Uh, all things were made through him. Not a surprise to see these two ideas going together, that we have the book of Genesis referenced deliberately by the opening expression in the beginning, and then a statement about creation, original creation, you, if you will. And then the statement, in him was life. In the original creation story, we all know that life wasn't created on uh, when the heavens and the earth were created, or on day one, or on day two. And then eventually the life of humanity was created climactically on day six. And uh, that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. Well, darkness wasn't, I mean, there was physical darkness, but in this context, uh, we're talking now as a metaphor for spiritual darkness, for the fall, humanity fell. So you can see just right away in our first paragraph, there's a kind of symbolic narrative progression going from the beginning, recounting the beginning of Genesis, and then highlighting some of the features of the story of the original creation. And no surprise that the emphasis on life comes out. In him, in the word, in the logos, was life, because after all, that's what the book is going to try to offer to uh, the reader, is life. So we're going right back to the original story of where life came from, what the source of life was. And uh, a statement, he was in the world, that is the logos, 
came into the world. He was in the world. That's the, crea the uh, incarnation. And his own, uh, he came to his own, and his, uh, excuse me, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He was rejected at, uh, he was crucified. However, everyone who did receive him, who believed in his name, they become children born of God. So people are already humans. They've been born physically, but now they're reborn, and this is a new creation. So we see a natural progression again. It's a historical narrative, even though there's a lot of metaphor through here. It's still following a kind of narrative arc starting from the new the old creation the original creation all the way up to the new creation of those who are born through Christ reborn into a new life again none of this should be totally surprising that this is how the book starts given the stated purpose of the book which is to offer life to those who read it in the name of for those who believe in in uh, in the to have life in the name of Jesus all right, now, it then says the word became flesh, and I've switched the font color here to blue because word became flesh is referring to the incarnation. But that's already been mentioned. He was in the world right here. The word became flesh. But obviously this is just restating the idea that he came into the world. So it's, it's, going, it's sort of going backwards. You may recall that the uh, beginning of the book of Genesis uh, provides a kind of survey of the creation story across seven days and then chapter two of Genesis goes backwards and picks up day six and investigates in more detail the creation of humanity. So in a way John is doing something that at least reminds one of that here in verse 14 going backwards and picking up the incarnation and then he'll describe the what the Incarnation revealed in more detail, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, but the Logos has, has made him known. And then we start the testimony of John the Baptizer. And John the Baptizer identifies himself as a voice crying in the wilderness, just as the prophet Isaiah said. Jesus, of course, in the Synoptic Gospels, will refer to John as a prophet. No surprise here since John is identifying himself as a voice that is fulfilling prophecy, crying out in the wilderness, announcing something, and his announcement is, make straight the way of the Lord. So he's identifying himself as a prophet, someone who's sent by God to deliver a message from God to his generation. And therefore, it won't be surprising that in the next day, we have two prophecies. These are prophecies in the sense that they're announcing things about the future. Behold, the Lamb of God who is taking away the sin of the world. Uh, the one who's going to take away the sin of the world. Obviously, Jesus had not taken away the sin of the world yet when John said this on the next day, nor did he do it that day. He, his taking away the sin of the world was yet to come. It was announcing something about the future. And then another statement about the future. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John the prophet, the one who's announcing in the wilderness uh, as a messenger from God, announces the future of uh, this event, which is, uh, happens at Pentecost, the baptism in the Spirit. This does not happen within uh, this period here while John is b doing his baptism ministry and so on. This is not happening right now. It's yet in the future. Uh, then uh, you have the next day. The question is asked, where are you staying? Uh, in Greek, mending. Uh, where do you dwell? Where do you remain? Where are you staying? In this context, it clearly just means where is he abiding for the evening. Like, where is he going to sleep? Where is he sleeping every night? It's a very practical question. It's a little odd, if you have never read this before, that the disciples ask him this question. Because he says to them, what are you seeking? 
And they say, well, where are you staying? He said, well, come come, and you will see. It all kind of sounds a little mysterious. And uh, he, they came and they saw where he was staying. And they themselves stayed with him. All right, we'll get back to that in a second. But the next thing we have after they stayed there that night is the conversion of Simon Peter. And the focus of that conversion is on his name change. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter or rock. Uh, it can mean a rock, but it can also just mean rock in the sense of the material rock as opposed to wood. Um, so let's just stop there for a second. Is there any reason why the author is putting so much emphasis on this idea of staying. Where does he stay? Where does he dwell? Where does he abide? And then the only the main focus of the conversion story is the name change to rock. Is there any relationship between these ideas? Where does Jesus abide? and the turning Peter into a rock, symbolically, um, or naming him a rock, kepha in Aramaic. And, well, of course, we're not supposed to just go outside of, the, of John to interpret everything, but we all know very well that when Peter, according to Matthew, is named a rock, the connection that Jesus makes is to the church upon this Petra, I will build, because rock is the kind of thing that you, you would build something on. It provides a solid foundation to build. But is that related to the question of abiding? Where does Jesus abide? And what does it mean Simon is rock, is a rock or is rock? <clears throat> Are these two ideas connected? Well, John is connecting them in that he's tied the two things together. And <clears throat> it is true, isn't it, that Jesus, according to multiple places in the New Testament, widespread belief among the early Christians in different writings, that that when someone becomes a new creation, they become a living stone. They become part of a new temple, a new structure, an edifice. And what's the point of building a new temple or a new edifice, a new house? The answer is that it's a place for God to dwell in, for him to abide in it. So we'll just say, Maybe there's a connection between those two things. We'll come back to it. Then you have the conversion of Nathaniel. And the conversion of Nathaniel is the idea that he's skeptical. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He can't believe that the Messiah, according to Philip, uh, who finds him and tells him about Jesus, he can't believe that, that Nazareth is the source of Messiah. He's skeptical about this. And when he comes to Jesus, Jesus says, an Israelite uh, alithos, truly, indeed, true, a, a true Israelite in whom there's no deceit. This is in contrast to the first Israelite, Jacob, the cheater, Yaakov. And a, a true Israelite is someone who acknowledges Jesus as the Son of God. This is according to the author, obviously. And uh, you are the King of Israel. So a true Israelite one who acknowledges Jesus as the Son of God and as the King of Israel. And then to him is given something uh, about the future. Notice the tense. You will see. Jesus says to Nathanael, you'll see the heaven opened, the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And this is referring to Jacob's vision, uh, vision excuse me, of the gate of heaven in Genesis. And the gate of heaven in uh, Genesis is referring to the government of God, the ancient cities 
the rulers of the city governed, they met and administered the affairs of the city at the gate. And so the vision of the angels ascending and descending is the government of God operating on earth because the Son of Man is down on earth and the angels of are ascending and descending on upon the Son of Man who appears to be down upon earth, and the government is being administered upon earth. And this is yet in the future. It's future tense as it's announced to Nathaniel. And then the final thing is this wedding uh, in Cana where um, the, the wedding coordinator goes to the bridegroom Notice this is an error. It's not the bridegroom who's provided the wine miraculously or in any other way for the guests, but the wedding coordinator doesn't know this. He just assumes it's the bridegroom, and he goes and says something to the bridegroom. Everyone serves the good wine first, but you have kept the good wine until now. You've saved it for the end. Why would John include a statement to the wrong person? It's not, it's not, it's supposed to, it's Jesus who's provided it. And yet John includes this statement. In fact, it's the final line of the story. It's a, it's a statement made to the wrong person. But why would he do that? Well, it's because John, presumably, John sees the irony of this or the symbolism of it, if you will. Because in the next, in the next, uh, in, excuse me, in a chapter and a half, He's going to have uh, record how John the Baptizer describes Jesus as the bridegroom, and John the Baptizer is just the friend of the bridegroom. So this statement to the actual bridegroom at the wedding in Cana, even though it's wrongly stated to him, as if he's the provider of the wine, our author sees in it. There's some truth in this, because Jesus was a bridegroom who had come to earth to seek a bride. And he was saving the best wine for the end. This, of course, a marriage is a new creation. The two shall become one flesh. Marriage is a new beginning. And uh, even the dullest of readers could see that that seems like a fitting end to our beginning, <laughs> because at the beginning, we were told, uh, in the beginning, and now we have, at the end of the section, a new beginning, a, a, a wedding. So what we're going to do now is just take a look at this. Let's just review it real quickly and see if you start to notice something about the order of things. Yes, in the beginning, the original creation, all things were made through him, then the creation of life, and the fall into darkness and light shining in the darkness, and then the incarnation eventually, as promised in Genesis 3. A human would one day come, born of the woman, to crush the enemy of humanity and thereby restore humanity, in response to which Adam called Eve Eve, because Eve, the name Eve, means life. I hope you see the connection here to our book. And how Jesus came to his own, but they didn't receive him. This is, again, this is historical narrative going forward in time. And after his crucifixion, all those who believed become children. They become new creations. So you begin with original creation and you end with new creation. By the way, I uh, originally heard this uh, analysis, though I can't remember exactly quite all the details, so a lot of this is my own uh, layers on top of it, but I originally heard it from uh, David Gooding, who, as you know, those who've listened to some of these previous videos, the original structure outline here came from Gooding and the idea that John is organized around the festivals, but I'm not claiming anything else here. It came from Gooding. Uh, and uh, the, so anyway, a creation to new creation. And then you go backwards 
to the incarnation right here. And that lines up right here. And now we go forward again. <clears throat> the Word became flesh, yes, and He made God known. And then the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. At the cross, He is rejected. And then later He baptizes in the Holy Spirit. That event, of course, is after the crucifixion. And then after the baptism of the Spirit, what is the question? Where does He abide now? Where does Jesus abide? Well, he abides in a new, a newly built structure of living stones. First Peter, the letter by Peter, the first one, has a passage about living stones being used to build a house for God, a spiritual house. Uh, so that, of course, follows the baptism of the Holy Spirit historically. And then, subsequent to this, is the conversion of a skeptical Israelite who becomes a true Israelite. The Apostle Paul, in Romans chapters 9 to 11, describes a future restoration of the nation of Israel. All Israel will be saved, he says. Whatever exactly that means, it's some type of en masse restoration of Israel, which of course hadn't happened when Paul wrote Romans. It was yet in the future. Daniel uh, seems to depict it as something that is the end of the ages, the grand jubilee so to speak, of history, according to Daniel in the visions, the four visions, uh, the overlapping visions of Daniel 7, uh, 8, and then uh, 7, 8, 9, and chapters 10 to 12. And then the final story is a wedding. You've kept the good wine until now. The best wine comes at the end of the wedding reception. So let's, let's now look at it like this, <clears throat> original creation, the creation of life, the fall of man, incarnation, rejection, and new creation. It's a chronological account or a narrative account of the chronology of mass epics of time and of God's purposes. And now let's add the second part where you go back to the incarnation, the prophecy about the crucifixion, the baptism in the Spirit, the church as God's dwelling place, the restoration of skeptical Israel, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. How does the book of the Revelation describe the new creation? It describes it how? chapters 19, 20, 21, following, as a bride coming down, adorned for her husband, where the joy will never run out. Here, the wine ran short, and Jesus filled up and replaced the wine. So the new creation is a place where the wine won't come up short. So, from original creation here to new creation in two sweeping uh, narratives, if you will, of the ages. Uh, if, if I remember, uh, I think it was Gooding uh, that said this was, this was a genealogy, but a genealogy of the ages, or something to that effect. I can't remember because it's been 30 years since I first heard uh, the, the general idea of the chronological order of some of these events and the statements, some of the prophecies and so on. And again, I'm not, uh, there's a lot, a lot of overlay of my own thinking because it's been a long time and I only was just hearing it when I was quite young. So anyway, that's another way to look at the introduction to the gospel, all because we started by looking at the structure 
and determined that this opening chapter and a half is one section. What unites it? What keeps it together? What does the writer have in mind uh, bringing coherence, cohesiveness to it? Uh, you can decide for yourself whether you think the thing we covered today is another layer of cohesion in this opening uh, section. Hope this was helpful.